I'm often amazed at how the past can feel familiar, yet so very distant at the same time. The irony of once being a child who can't wait to grow up, only to end up as an adult, wanting to return to those long-gone moments in time, desperately trying to recapture just a fraction of the beauty, magic and joyful innocence of childhood. Nostalgia. At some point, this real emotion can overwhelm us all, and one band that surely wouldn't argue is Boards of Canada. The elusive Scottish duo has managed to make an entire career by fully tapping into this very feeling, with their unique sound evoking childhood memories in almost anyone who listens. But why is that, and how exactly are they able to conjure up these emotions in us? In this video, we'll take a closer look at the band that's been called one of the best loved electronic acts of the last two decades, specifically their debut album Music Has the Right to Children, that challenged the trend of modern breakbeats in favor of a vintage sound with more melody and emotion. It's an analog masterpiece in a digital age. It's a great outdoors! to be Scottish! It's shy being Scottish! And all the fresh air in the world won't make any fucking difference! Don't take Renton's word for it. Boards of Canada actually thrive by leading a rural life in the Scottish countryside. But since they stay away from the hustle and bustle of big cities, rarely give interviews and basically never played live, they've often been painted as these mysterious druids making cryptic music from a secluded bunker. But this couldn't be further from the truth, and behind the myth of Boards of Canada are just two normal, music-loving brothers. Mike Sanderson and Marcus Owen grew up in a musical family in the small town of Cullen, and started composing and recording their own songs as early as age 10. In the late 70s, during a brief family relocation to Alberta, the brothers were exposed to the documentaries of the National Film Board of Canada, from which they would later derive their name, and the dystopian science fiction prevalent at the time. The tone, feel and grit of all the above would later lay the foundation for their unique sound. You gotta tell them, silent breathe is people! Back in Scotland, the teenage years were spent playing in more traditional bands, while after school becoming more and more serious about recording electronic music. But with the advent of Acid House and the surge in UK electronic, the brothers instead favoured playing atmospheric rock in the vein of My Bloody Valentine, greatly influenced by their iconic album Loveless. But this venture didn't last, as Mike and Marcus eventually went back to their electronic roots. What followed was a period of slowly arriving at their trademark sound by recording a series of albums shared only with friends and family. Sanderson stating that they literally have cases full of unreleased tapes. A few of their recordings eventually got to see the light of day when they started appearing on file sharing sites. While unfortunate for the band that these very private tapes got leaked, they do give us a good glimpse into the early music of Boards of Canada. Around this time they had also recorded an EP which ended up catching the ear of Autickers Sean Booth, who then asked them to make a record for their label Scam. Boards of Canada's first public release, High Scores, was released in 1996. Every once in a while, an album comes along that doesn't seem to fit in its era, instead transcending it, hitting us on a deeper, more subconscious level. But what really makes a timeless album? Well, staying away from the current trends certainly helps. When Boards of Canada rose to prominence, CDs ruled music consumption. The world was eagerly chasing the most crisp digital sound, and their warp contemporaries were mostly known for IDM, glitch and drill and bass. Futuristic, frantic beats meant to take your brain to another dimension.
Ports of Canada, on the other hand, went in totally the opposite direction, instead favoring a degraded, smudgy and imperfect sound that flirted with the past. And despite being lumped in the electronic category, they never set out to try and make people dance, instead putting more weight on melody, soul and emotion rather than rhythm. Music has the right to children, saw Boards of Canada taking the listener on a cryptic and psychedelic journey, inviting us to a smorgasbord of everything from vintage sounds to obscure samples, geometry and childlike wonder. If one were to try and describe the album's sound, maybe try and picture yourself on acid, watching some worn out VHS tapes of old kid shows, while at the same time humming nursery rhymes. And in the background, there's a malfunctioning shortwave radio trying to transmit some fragmented hip hop beats. This obsession with nostalgia is at the core of everything Boards of Canada does, and it shines through not only in the music. The album title, according to Sanderson, is a play on words from an old 70s textbook called Children Have the Right to Music. And about the artwork, he went on to explain that if there's sadness in the way we use memory, it's because the time you're focusing on has gone forever. It's a theme we play on a lot, that bittersweet thing where you face up to the fact that certain chapters of your life are just Polaroids now. Okay, but what's up with the washed out faces? Is it a reflection on time itself? Like how we sometimes struggle to recognize our past selves? Are we maybe meant to project our own faces to get a more personal listening experience? Or do the brothers just love psychedelic imagery and thought it looked trippy? Who knows? As with anything Boards of Canada, it's cryptic. Visuals aside, to achieve this trip down memory lane, Boards of Canada obviously use a lot of vintage equipment. The Yamaha CS70 has come up as their trademark synthesizer and the Akai S1000 as their favorite sampler. They've also sworn by using old low quality tape machines to further degrade and age their sound. But it's important to note that their musical vision relies on much more than just fancy equipment. For instance, take the percussion in An Eagle in Your Mind, which was created entirely by recording Mike's girlfriend making weird phonetic sounds, chopping it up and turning it into something completely different. I'm an artist and if you give me a tuba, I'll bring you something out of it. Further, one of the most unique aspects of Boards of Canada's method of evoking nostalgia is their way of composing plenty of short, melodic interludes that sound familiar to us while at the same time being impossible to place. How is that? Well, it's because they never existed in the first place. According to Sanderson, it's something people don't normally pay much attention to like the strings at the end of programs, the corporate logos with a little flourish and a little happy melody. They're ultimate in psychedelia, but no one ever notices them or talks about them. Whereas a pop song disappears after a few weeks, a jingle will be repeated for 10 years and end up subliminally lodged in people's brains. Again, what really makes a timeless album? Well, in the case of Music Has the Right to Children, spanning the use of vintage equipment, obscure samples, familiar melodies and psychedelic imagery, the common denominator is always nostalgia. And this affection for the past seems to even have the power to transcend time itself and become strangely prophetic. On the album Closer, one very important thought. Boards of Canada ties it all together by sampling the 80s adult film A Brief Affair. In a thought-provoking speech, we hear a woman defending the personal freedoms we've always taken for granted, but that are now gradually being more and more threatened. With everything from Covid lockdowns to online censorship and restrictions on freedom of speech, this closing message is eerily resonant in today's modern world. It would be wise to remember that the same people who would stop you from viewing an adult film may be back next year to complain about a book or even a TV program. If you can be told what you can see or read, 
then it follows that you can be told what to say or think. Defend your constitutionally protected rights. No one else will do it for you. Thank you. Music Has the Right to Children was released to critical acclaim in April 1998, consequently turning dance music on its head and redefining the electronic genre. The album spawned several imitators and influenced countless others, including Radiohead, Tycho and Fortet, just to name a few. Boards of Canada went on to produce three more acclaimed studio albums, but it's now been 10 years since their last release, with us fans desperately hungering for more. Rumor has it that there's gonna be another one, but who knows? Again, as with anything Boards of Canada, it's cryptic. Anyway, new album or not, I think we have to be grateful for what we've got through the years. Boards of Canada truly standing out in the pantheon of electronic music. On Music Has to Write to Children, we're taking on a journey back to a long gone past. A more innocent time when we played carefree in the woods, swam in lakes and rode our bikes everywhere. A time when we stayed up all night playing video games and had to go get our photos developed at the camera store. And through their unique way of composing, tricking us with reminiscent melodies, Boards of Canada not only evokes nostalgia, but also floods us with memories that may or may not be our own, hitting us on a subconscious level. I think just the fact that they're even able to do that makes nostalgia one of our most human emotions. Nostalgia affects us all, not one person excluded, because we were all children once, and amid all the stress and responsibility of modern adulthood, it's important not to forget that. We are still that same child from the Polaroids, even though we might feel like a completely different person, and the child continues to live within us to this very day. The past, inside the present. Oh, orange. <laughs> 